would make this an especially meaningful conversation for you? Um, so the information I prepare to go back to that a little bit um, is mostly, you know, um, information regarding my specific application package and then where I am with my um, test preparation, you know, um, areas of skills that I would like to focus on or improve. So I kind of want to like run you through all the parts that I prepare and, you know, just listen to your thoughts and uh, what you think will be helpful for me to improve. Yeah, sure. Shoot. Fire away. Yeah, absolutely. So I took my first diagnostic test um, less than half a year ago, and I scored a 160. It was timed. And then I took another practice test about uh, four months ago, I think, and I scored a 153. So my, I, my scores, you know, are kind of um, unstable. Um, but, and I think my weakest area is logical reasoning. Um, I'm using the Khan Academy, uh, you know, a test prep that they co-developed with LSAC. So um, my level with logic reasoning is consistently just staying on medium, uh, while my reading comprehension and analytical reasoning has jumped from uh, you know, medium to advanced. So I think this is the area that I really want to focus on. And sp specifically, it was regards to logic reasoning. I think I'm kind of weaker in strengthen or weaken questions, and then also identifying techniques, roles, and principles. So yeah, I'd just like to hear your advice on how you know I can specifically tackle those questions, and uh, if you have any you know general advice for someone like me because I'm thinking about um, taking the LSAT next year. I don't have a set date, but I'm going to be taking the test next year, and then I'm thinking about applying uh, close to the end, at the end of the next year, and hopefully enter law school the year after. Sure, Mina. Well, it sounds like you have a good idea of areas that you need to focus on. You've identified some specific types of logical reasoning questions. And so if you're noticing that you're getting those disproportionately wrong mm -hmm. relative to their frequency as well, yeah. then that means that, of course, drilling those is the thing to do. So do several dozen strengthening questions, several dozen weakened questions, and any other types that give you trouble. I have a list on my website categorizing them, but you can also just pick them out of the exams themselves. And if you do that, you'll start to notice trends in terms of what is the proper perspective from which to view the stimulus, right. given that particular question type. Right. I have some foundational material covering each of those types as well on my website and on the YouTube channel in addition. Right. With regard to choosing a, a target test date, I would say choose one, pick one, book it, have it secured, and right. then at least you can move towards a specific goal. Because if you keep it vague, you might just keep pushing it off. And having a specific test date in mind will give you some incentive to study now and give you that momentum and a little bit of positive stress associated. And now at this point, the latest date available to book is April because that's the last test date of this particular admission cycle. In the spring, LSAC will open up registration for June and July and beyond. But if you want a date that is relatively early for you, I'd say going with any one of February, March, or April would be fine. I would suggest probably April just because it'll give you more time and it's the late, latest one available to you. Then once registration for future, future dates opens up, you could potentially book one of those as well just to have a backup date secured. But book early. They do fill up faster and faster more than ever before. I think LSAC is actually opening up fewer test centers than previous because they don't want to have to buy extra tablets perhaps. But okay. book one, get it locked down, go with that date in mind, and then eat, whether you take it in April or June or July, you'll still be able to apply at the very beginning of next cycle. Sounds great. Thank you. Yeah, that's very helpful. Um, so I, I also want to talk a little bit about myself as a candidate. So I graduated from Peking University. It's a top university in China. Um, uh, I studied English literature as an undergrad, so um, I have been working for the last two years at ByteDance, which is a uh, internet slash tech company, mostly for music licensing for its, uh, its music-oriented app called TikTok. Um, so I think my experience is kind of relevant to, you know, the field of copyright law. How do you, um, do you have any advice for um, someone like me that's entering law school possibly with a specific interest or, a, you know, um, gearing myself towards a very specific field? 
you know, just in terms of um, choosing schools and uh, applying for programs or even selecting courses once I'm in law school. Yeah, I think that you have the makings of a stellar application based on your work experience. I mean, tech and IP and copyright are all quickly growing fields. And furthermore, I mean, TikTok is a, I know it's a very fast growing social media platform that most people have barely heard of over the age of 30, perhaps, but it's a growing area. I would make it clear to define exactly what TikTok is on your resume and on your uh, any statements that you write about it because they may not have heard of it, even though it's a booming area of focus. And obviously they, they know what copyright is. They know what IP is. Mm-hmm. So I think writing some sort of personal statement that, that ties this together and shows how your work experience motivates your, or relates to your reasons for wanting to go to law school and showing your understanding of the field in particular, I think is going to be really compelling for you because a lot of law school applicants, they only know what they've seen in, on TV or in the movies about the practice mm-hmm. of law. And of course, the reality is much different. Mm-hmm. And so if your work experience can show that you have exposure to it, and mm-hmm. of course, your resume shows that you have good work experience that could lead to future job prospects as well, I right. think will be really compelling for them. So when you mention understanding of the field, do you think I should lean more heavily towards you know, talking about principles or more theoretical, the more theoretical side of things, or should I rely more on like examples or case studies that I have encountered in my work experience? Definitely the latter. No question about it. You want to make it real. You want to make it concrete. Anecdotes are important. Stories are important. Stay away from the theory. The the more theoretical it is, the less personal it is. So you want to say that I was working on this document related to this case, and this was the dilemma or this was the the conflict that they were facing, or just a question about where to go or what to do given the circumstances. But I would pick one specific example, or maybe one or two from, Mm -hmm. like, let's say there was this licensing deal that we were trying to make happen. These Mm -hmm. were the issues in play. This is how I handled it. It it, it kindled my under it, it kindled my excitement around this field. Okay. Sounds great. Uh, also, one other important piece of information about me, um, I will be kind of a splitter applicant because my, uh, my undergrad GPA isn't very high. It was 3.54 um, on my report. That's my overall GPA. My major GPA is a little higher. I think it's, uh, it's around seven, uh, 3.7. Um, so I think, you know, because law school really value uh, high GPA applicants. So I'm just wondering um, where I stand in terms of my application and what kind of competitive advantage, uh, advantage I will have over other candidates. Well, it is primarily numbers driven. So you have a good GPA. Thank the you. next thing is to get a top LSAT score to right. boost your application. It, it's primarily numbers. Your work experience will be an asset, okay. but it's not going to make the difference. Most likely it's really in most cases, more about the numbers. So I'd say the thing you can do is just get the top LSAT score possible. As for numbers and where you stand, LSAC has a LSAT GPA calculator on their site where you can put in your numbers and it'll show you how you stack up against students at that school. And there are other calculators as well, but without an actual real LSAT score, it's all theoretical. Right, that's true. So just based on your personal experience, um, you know, the past candidates that you've consulted with, what kind of a, a, an LSA score for someone, you know, with my GPA range um, would make them, what their application competitive if they want to get into like a T14 law school? Probably, it's typically the case for T14s that you want right. close to 170 and, and above. Right, okay. Regardless of your GPA, but the higher the GPA, the better. For international applicants, it can be a little bit different with GPA sometimes because LSAC calculates it uniquely and they don't always know how to read applications from overseas. Although I think for Peking University, top university in China, I think they will probably know more about it than someone from another country who did not go to as well renowned a university. In general, for international applicants, the GPA tends to be a little bit weighted less heavily because they don't always know how to interpret it. Yeah. But in the case of Peking University, I think it might be an exception since it is so well known. Um, so yeah, those were the things that I, I mostly wanted to talk about prior to you know come into this conversation. But do you have any questions for me or just any general suggestions for me 
um, you know, in my application process. Well, I guess my biggest question for you is, I know you're thinking a lot about, about the admissions, but the LSAT is still a big question mark and you have a lot of time ahead of you to make it happen. So I guess my question for you is, if you, let's say you're taking it theoretically in, in April, you've got nearly six months. Yeah. What do those six months look like for you in terms of other obligations and fitting in the time, especially since you're not starting from scratch. So it's really a question more of working on the identified weak areas. Um, so yeah, um, I would, I feel like my schedule has been pretty packed, um, you know, juggling a full-time job and then also the test prep. So yeah, I haven't been as committed as I should have been, but lately I've been trying to squeeze in at least two hours of practice every day, you know, just in between meetings or um, after work when I get off. So I think I'm going to be consistently ramping that up. So during the week, um, you know, at least one or two hours of practice every day. And then during the weekend, I will be able to allocate bigger chunks of time just to practice. So and in terms of that practice alone, I think I will be dividing that uh, proportionally to my week areas, like, like you suggested. But yeah, if you have more suggestions, I definitely welcome them all. No, well, it sounds like you are willing to put in the time which is fantastic. I would urge you not to run the risk of burnout. Two hours a day isn't likely to lead to that, but depending on your other obligations, it may become a bit much. And so know that when you're studying over a longer time period, you don't need to do quite as much every single day. It's more slow and steady wins the race when you're studying over a five to six month timeline or beyond. So be consistent. Do Try to do something on most days but mm -hmm. don't stress overly about taking a day off here or there. And this isn't something that you really should cram or even can cram. It's really more about exposing yourself to the wide range of patterns of methods of reasoning or patterns and the tricks they use to make tempting wrong answers or discouraging right answers. And so that exposure to those patterns, it happens through doing lots and lots of LSAT questions, especially in the category of logical reasoning, which is, I think, going to be your focus. Mm -hmm. So if you can expose yourself to a couple hundred or even more like a couple thousand of these LSAT logical reasoning questions just to expose yourself to what they look like, what tricks you are uniquely prone to falling for, understanding those in depth so you can avoid making the same mistakes in the future. All right. look, at it, look at it as something to get slowly acclimated to over a longer period of time, not something that we're like, there's the, the 50 patterns you're going to learn. And if you could memorize those, that would be it. There are more than 50 and they're not something to memorize it. There's something to see and recognize when they appear. What would you say is the biggest insight you got from our call today? Um, I would say definitely to be clear on a set day to sort of, you know, put the timeline uh, and solidify sort of like the pressure for preparing the application, but also have a specific game plan for attacking the day to day. And then also um, being able to focus on real tests, especially in my weaker areas to be able to, you know, um, go through a lot of questions, real practices to hone my skills, and then also check out the book. <laughs> Great. Fantastic, Mina. Well, I'm glad I was able to help. Please keep in touch and let me know if you need anything at all as you move forward. Absolutely. Thank you. Thanks for tuning into the show. Please subscribe if you haven't done so already to be notified of new episodes as I release them. And feel free to reach out if you need anything at all as you move forward with your prep. I'm happy to help however I can. In the meantime, I wish you all the best and take care.